Hi, this is Zach Phillips, and we're here interviewing Mr. Plant about the Cold War. Hi, my name is Russell Plant, and uh, I'm being interviewed about the Cold War, the early years of it, because I was born in July 16th, 1945, and by the time I was in my mid-teens, it was the height of the, uh, the Cold War between the uh, United States and the Russians. Oh, what do you what do you remember of the Cold War? Like, what was your life like? I remember uh, well back in those days, my friends all lived in the country, and so did I. We lived all in rural areas, but some of the new families that moved in, they were having houses built with underground bunkers, which were called fallout shelters. And I remember going down there with, like, with my friend, and it had a ventilation system. It was all just in case there was a nuclear bomb going off, like we were going to be attacked by the Russians. So these people were, uh, they would build fallout shelters. There are storm cellars or outside vegetable storage cellars. They may be used as shelters from fallout. If you plan to use such a cellar, or your basement, or any other shelter, stock it with food and supplies. To equip and supply your shelter area, you need some of the same things you might take on a vacation camping trip. First, sleeping equipment to fit your shelter area. Folding cots, or sleeping bags, and blankets. Then, food and water. There should be at least a two-week supply. You'll want plenty of fruit juices and lots of your family's favorite canned foods. The drinking water supply should be rotated often to be sure it's fresh. And don't forget such basic needs as sugar, salt, pepper, and other seasoning that your family ordinarily uses. Now, some equipment. A radio is very important. It should be a battery portable with spare batteries. A transistorized radio is best, as the batteries last longer. Next, you need light in the form of flashlights and a battery-operated lantern. Then, a good first aid kit. Now, plates, cups, silverware. A can opener and a bottle opener are important. Add to these things, enough closed containers to take care of garbage and human waste. Especially if there will be children in the shelter, include some books and magazines, paper and pencils, maybe one or two small, simple games. The best protection of all is the special shelter built according to specifications of your local civil defense organization. This has an air filter to allow ventilation but keep dust out. And it has at least three feet of earth. Were and you scared of getting nuked? Uh, not then, when I uh, looked about the fallout shelters. But then a few years later, we would have uh, civil defense, civil defense uh, sirens going off. Air raids, simulated air raids. As like a test? Yep, to yep. Yeah. Teach you what to do? Yeah, yeah. So it's like go a Go for fire shelter, drum, go to a base. Yeah. Soviets? Yeah, nice. yeah. And we were just terrified of the communists. But they were terrified of us also. Because we both, uh, the United States and the Russians, at the end of the uh, Second World War, we both ended up facing one another, Germany. We were the victors, both of us were. But the Russians wanted a lot of uh, the scientists, and so did we, <clears throat> the nuclear scientists. And the ones that we captured actually uh, perfected the, nu the nuclear bomb. Did you, were you taught like what was going on in school or did you, did they talk about it in school? Did you... Gee, my parents didn't talk about it. Were your parents scared of it? Did they warn you about anything? No. No, I don't remember those conversations. 
and everyone didn't have a fallout shelter. Just, Just some elements. people did, yeah, yeah. The ones that could afford it. Yeah. I mean, who would want to live anyway if there was a nuclear attack? Yeah. <laughs> would you want to be the last man standing? Uh, but then as it progressed and I got older, it, uh, uh, my next thing was the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 60s. The Cold War was still going on now. Mm -hmm. And I'm in my 30s, and all of a sudden it's the uh, 1965, the Cuban Missile Crisis where we put a blockade around Cuba because the Russians were moving in missiles mm -hmm. that we could see it from way up in space by these spy satellites. After World War II, relations between the former allies, the United States of America and the Soviet Union broke down and brought about an era known as the Cold War, where the world was divided by politics and ideology into East and West. The end of World War II had brought about a new age of warfare in the form of the atomic bomb. The 1950s saw a massive amount of nuclear testing with the USA and the Soviet Union constantly demonstrating how powerful they were. One incident which could have ended it all for everyone was the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. After the Cuban Revolution led by Fidel Castro in 1959, Cuba, who had been an ally of the US, began to make links with the Soviets. America attempted to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs by training Cuban exiles but suffered a defeat. The Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev had the idea to place nuclear missiles in Cuba to deter any future invasion, similar to the Jupiter missiles the US had placed in Turkey and Italy in case of a Soviet invasion. He also wanted the NATO-controlled West Berlin, which he planned to bargain for. The missiles were secretly shipped to Cuba and construction began to make them operational. On October 14th, an American U-2 aircraft noticed the missiles in Cuba and the CIA informed the President the next morning in Washington DC. The medium-range ballistic missiles had the ability to launch as far as DC. The long-range ballistic missiles could reach almost all of the contiguous United States. President, what they teach you in high school, like for history-wise, did they cover what was going on? Like, no, I had a modern European history. Did they talk about it at all? In no. So you you got most of your knowledge about that, what was going on from the news? From the news, TV shows would cover it. I would say, oh, I can remember that in these little incidents. But that was the big thing then, but there was a period where it was scary. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, sort of similar like to this uh, virus that's going around now. Zika, Zika virus. Zika virus? It was like that. I mean, that's, if that keeps progressing, it's going to be scary. And it's going to be the same type of feelings we had in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Or just like, no. what, what would happen if we did get bombed? We would just be, we would, when we played and stuff, we would just be the good guys and the bad guys would call the Reds. <laughs> How was the economy affected by the whole war? Was it, did you notice a change? Were you not, like, were your parents not able to buy you as much because of the war? Like everything was, or school funding or something was cut? Gas prices went up, anything like Oh, my word. I was, uh, at the beginning, I was just too young to even, it was a housing boom, because all, uh, all the servicemen came over from the war. And then they were having, getting married, having babies, there was a boom. Mm -hmm. There was a housing boom. All the time when the Cold War was going on, the economy was good. So a lot of people didn't even, uh, didn't even, uh, it didn't even affect them. Mainly it was the military buildup on both sides that, that's what destroyed Russia in the Cold War. They mm -hmm. couldn't keep up with the financial part that in 91 and 92, it was, Russia was broke up. Did, how did, how was the whole, whole war Pro portrayed, portrayed. Is that the right word? How was the that whole we war were good portrayed? and the Russians were evil? They were the evil empire. So it sort kinda, of like a Star Wars type thing. Yeah, it was kind of. It was more like was we just, were good, they were bad. Yeah, it was not really yeah. telling what was actually happening. Right, right. We were getting the propaganda. You guys were our propaganda. Uh huh. 
it's funny how all that works. The Russians were going the other way. That we were the bad ones. What were they saying about it on the news? Like they would. It was like an unwritten, after a while, was everybody became used to it. The Vietnam War started. And that wasn't, and, uh, and like the Russia, the communist empire, or whatever, was helping support the North Vietnamese. And we were supporting the South Vietnamese. It was just, you didn't really, you knew there was a Cold War going on, mm -hmm. that we weren't friendly, but it wasn't, uh, the fear of being attacked at any minute was gone. Give us a room with a view of the beautiful Rhine. Elvis Presley hits West Germany. The well-known guitarist has come to bolster NATO forces, in particular a third U.S. armored division tank unit. I got the love to three for the occupation G.I. West Germany was NATO's front line along the Iron Curtain. Since 1955, the Americans had been training a new West German army. Some thought that could mean a German finger on NATO's nuclear trigger. German rearmament brought back nightmares for many Europeans, above all for the Russians. The new weaponry alarmed East Germany, the German Democratic Republic. Die DDR hat ja nun versucht, verschiedene Angebote zu machen, um eine nuklear... The GDR made various offers to prevent the nuclear armament of West Germany. But it found no response, no echo. The GDR felt directly threatened by tactical nuclear weapons. It accepted that the Soviet army, stationed on GDR territory, also should arm itself with tactical nuclear weapons. Berlin, deep in East German territory, was under the joint occupation of the former wartime allies. Now in West Berlin, 12,000 British, American and French soldiers were surrounded by half a million Soviet and East German troops. Western rights of access were protected by four power agreement. Each day, thousands moved freely between the Soviet and Western sectors. Berlin's open border gave East Germans access to the glittering West, which Soviet and East German leaders wanted to end. West Berlin immer gefährlicher wurde für die Existenz der DDR und damit auch für die Existenz des Sozialismus und daraus. West Berlin was becoming increasingly dangerous to the existence of the GDR and the existence of socialism. Khrushchev proposed to create a free city of Berlin with special rights of its own, with its own foreign policy, its own police, and its own symbolic foreign forces. Khrushchev thought that some pressures should be put on the Americans, and uh, the obvious place was West Berlin. So that... This was a sort of shock ter therapy <laughs> on the part of Khrushchev, I would say. In November 1958, the West rejected Khrushchev's Berlin proposals. Khrushchev now offered East German leader Walter Ulbricht a peace treaty. It threatened Western rights in Berlin. He said that unless agreement were reached, that uh, Berlin would be turned over to the East Germans within six months. Uh, we regarded that as, a, as an ultimatum. Eisenhower felt that the Soviets were doing something that was not really in their interest. His view was that if there were to be actual conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, it would move quickly to large-scale, all-out conflict where everything would be drawn in. Some weren't 
pushing the button uh -huh. <laughs> to attack the other side by accident, somebody deranged or whatever. How did you, what did you think was going to happen with the whole, the whole war? How did you think it was going to end up? With... Well, I never thought there was going to be a war because I, I, I just thought we'd all be destroyed. By, and by Russia? Each other. Oh, yeah. Each other. We both had enough to go. They had rockets from Russia to the U.S. We had them from the U.S. to Russia. The nuclear fear. submarines. Yeah. We're still making now. And your biggest fear was just that both, an accident was going to happen. Blown up. Yeah, well, that would be the end. Mm -hmm. was, uh, like, uh, the biggest fear was an accident happening. Were there any? Wait, like what when there you... were accidents, uh, there were submarines that there were submarines that sunk. Uh -huh. Nuclear powered submarines. <laughs> the Cold War turned into the armaments race. Mm -hmm. Who could build the baddest and the most weapons? <laughs> we were building these nuclear submarines, which we still do. They do. They don't do it as much now because they couldn't keep up with it financially. Mm -hmm. That must have been pretty scary. Well, getting drafted going to Vietnam was scary. It had nothing to do with the Cold War. You know, it was just... <laughs> there was a bunch of things going on. The Cold War went on from... Uh, geez, great, 1946 to 91, maybe? That's a lot of years, yeah. a lot of decades. Do you remember having bomb drills in school? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, that was still part of that civil defense air raid system. The sirens would go off. And it wasn't a siren like a fire station. There were poles in strategic locations that signaled it was an air raid and not a fire. Mm -hmm. And they were loud and different. Then we had to crouch down get underneath the desk, or if you were home, or if it was in the summertime and you were somewhere, you would go to the basements of different locations. Mm -hmm. And of course, and, there'd be a, a, and there was an announcement too from the, oh my God, uh, from the, oh God, the Civil Defense Service saying that this is only a test, no need to panic, it's gonna last for 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how that would work. So that was scary at first, and after a while it was, it was like irritating because the sound was so... Yeah. And the and a lot of the tel utility poles in different areas would have a certain decal on them. And that signified that this was a shelter. Either it was near a church or a town hall or an auditorium, but that's, that's where a shelter now, would be. we must be ready for a new danger. The atomic bomb. First, you have to know what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. You will know when it comes. We hope it never comes, but we must get ready. It looks something like this. There is a bright flash, brighter than the sun, brighter than anything you've ever seen. If you are not ready and did not know what to do, it could hurt you in different ways. It could knock you down hard or throw you against a tree or a wall. It is such a big explosion it can smash in buildings and knock signboards over and break windows all over town. But if you duck and cover like Bert, you will be much safer. You know how bad sunburn can feel. The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn, especially where you're not covered. Now, you and I don't have shells to crawl into like Bert the turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck and your face. Duck and cover underneath a table or desk or anything else close by. In Betty's school, they are talking about the atomic bomb too. Betty is asking her teacher, how can we tell when the atomic bomb may explode? And her teacher is explaining that there are two kinds of attack, with warning and without any warning. 
We think that most of the time we will be warned before the bomb explodes. So there will be time for us to get into our homes, schools, or some other safe place. Our civil defense workers and our men in uniform will do everything they can to warn us before enemy planes can bring a bomb near us. You may be in your schoolyard playing when the signal comes. That signal means to stop whatever you are doing and get to the nearest safe place fast. Always remember, the flash of an atomic bomb can come at any time, no matter where you may be. You might be out playing at home when the warning comes. Then be sure to get into the house fast where your parents have fixed a safe place for you to go. If you are not close to home when you hear the warning, go to the nearest safe cover. Know where you are to go, or ask an older person to help you. You know the places marked with the S sign? There are safe places to go when you hear the alarm. If there is a warning, you will hear it before the bomb explodes. But sometimes, and this is very, very important, sometimes the bomb might explode without any warning. Then the first thing we would know about it would be the flash. And that means duck and cover fast, wherever you are. There's no time to look around or wait. Be like Bert. When there is a flash, duck and cover, and do it fast. What did you do for a job when you were, like, a teenager, or even in your teens? I was a painter. Even and then, then I painted. Painting? Yeah, yeah. I painted a lot of, uh, I painted components of nuclear submarines. For the military? Yeah, yeah. And it's a special kind of paint. Yeah. To, uh, <laughs> to uh, distract the uh, underwater sonar. That's what they're, they're invisible under the ocean. They, they can't be detected by radar. It's berserk. But it, it would be all those co coatings doing that. At Quonset. And then going to Groton, Connecticut. <laughs> And you have to go through special clearance. Just to paint? To make sure you wasn't a Russian. <laughs> Just to make sure you wasn't a communist. Like. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that was... Like, <laughs> that must have been interesting. Like, nuclear warheads. <laughs> no, nuclear submarines. submarines. The warheads aren't on them yet, but it's just nuclear. <laughs> Did you... So was that like... Your own little business, or oh, no. did you work for somebody? Yeah, I worked for a military contractor. Actually, it was for the Navy. Really? The underwater Did submarine. they come to you, or did you come to them? Were they looking for somebody? They were looking for manpower, civilian manpower, to do these contracts. Did they pay you for it, or was it kind of, did they make it like your, your civil duty? No, 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 you got paid. Oh, they were good jobs. Yeah, they were good jobs. Did it? The Cold War cost a lot of money. Yeah. It was like no expense was. <laughs> Is that the only job you had? Did you ever work on farms or work with anything? No, oh, I started out working on farms. Yeah, failing Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. In my teen years, in my uh, oh god, from from eleven to. To 16, I worked every summer, like on farms, baling hay, or, uh, or help with the milking. We always had to work just to stay busy. Yeah. But it was fun. I loved it. How did they advertise the war? Was it like, did they, would they show on TV, cartoon shows? How did it all that, come on through? That we were the good guys, they were the bad guys. The propaganda was, uh, I mean, it was like a, it was a, like a form of brainwashing. But I realized early on that the Russians were doing the same thing with their people, telling them, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, their side of the story and making up stuff. It was, uh, you know. They're the evil empire, just like I said earlier, that they were bad, we were good. <laughs> what, what was your personal opinion about the Russians? And the whole war itself? 
Well, I was scared, scared of him, because you always heard the negative stuff. And he is, he is, yeah, yeah, I was afraid of him. Did you believe that there was a that they were good, or did any good to them at all? Because well, we never seen it. Yeah. We never seen it. Mm -hmm. It's like. Uh, it's like for all those years, Castro wasn't letting no American uh, TV or radio to go to, to Cuba. They didn't want the other side. They didn't, like Castro and his Cubans, they didn't want the, the population to know how nice the rest of the world is. Mm -hmm. So now as I'm older, I realize... Uh, you know, it isn't all, uh, it isn't all truth what you see on TV or reported that you got to delve into stuff and find out, find out uh, both sides, three sides. But that's, that's that. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Plant. Thank you, Mr. Plant. It was very Thank nice you. to it was good, Thank you uh, for letting me interview you. It was good reminiscing about all that. Sure it was. But all in all, it was good being a kid. Well, I gotta get going. Yep. See you later, man.